Good morning. just started the timer. I'm in Switzerland. I need to make sure. I really finished this on time. <laughs> My name is Marius Vetric. I'm from WP Riders Agency, and today we are going to talk about how to price WordPress projects and software projects in general. And when we talk about pricing, I always connect that to estimates. And I, before we move on into the presentation, I would like you to raise your hand. Have you ever told somebody, ah, it's going to take me one hour to reinstall my laptop. <laughs> now, please keep up your hand. Those of you who really managed to do it in one hour. Indeed, estimates are hard. There are no hands up. Estimates are hard both in real life as well as when we talk about software projects. And actually, there are two case studies, famous, uh, famous researchers, one from Standard Group, the other one from Wellington, showing that only 36% of the projects are delivered as successful. How do they define success in this case? They say a project is successful if it's delivered on time, in, uh, in budget, within budget, and within scope. Right? In the... In the Software prep in the software industry, there's uh, an even harder uh, practice, best practice. I found out that people do estimate a project and then they just multiplied the total effort by two or by three. Well, uh, we've developed a methodology that for this year, for this year it yields an under 25% rate of estimation error. And in the next few minutes, I'm going to discuss with you how are we doing it? What is the process that we are following? It's a very thorough process. Besides, besides, the estimates, uh, besides estimating the, the software for, um, for pricing, I found out there are three other reasons to estimate a software project. Whenever you estimate, you really dive into details. You need to understand what's in that software project. Are you going to have five pages, ten pages, maybe a WooCommerce installed, maybe a Learn Dash, and so on. So you really need to understand the requirements. So you get clarity by, by estimating. Next, once you get clarity, you can break down the project to milestones. And once you have milestones, you are able to properly plan your resources, your project, you can calculate how many developers do you need, how many testers, how many backend developers, frontend, designers, and so on. So before moving into the actual process of estimation, I found out there are three types of things that we generally estimate when we estimate a software project. The first one is estimating the things that we know. Generally speaking, this is very easy to estimate. For instance, you need to develop the header of a new website. But you have been developing headers like this one 50 times in the past. So it's going to take you in just a few moments to estimate the new header. Right? Now moving on, we have to estimate things that we know we don't know what it's all about in there. Taking the same example, with, uh, with the header, supposedly our customer says, well, I need this header and the me menu to work really fine on Kindle Fire. Have you ever developed on Kindle Fire? <laughs> Me neither. Now, this is a known unknown. I know that I don't know how will that thing work out. It's very hard. It's hard to estimate these kind of things. And the next one is the unknown unknowns. These are the things that we are not even aware that we don't know. The same Kindle Fire example, let's say we don't even know that the HTML set is half of the normal HTML set. You don't know that. So you will have to hand code everything from scratch for that particular browser. That's very, very hard to properly estimate. And the process that we've developed handles all the three cases with known unknowns, unknown unknowns, 
and the things that you know. Okay? Ready to move into the process? There are seven steps. I'll quickly go through them, and then we will dive deep into every step. The first thing is to qualify the client. Do you know what's qualifying the client? Okay, briefly explained, it's deciding if that customer and project is a good fit for you. Okay? Next, we do a pre-scoping phrase. Scoping comes from, the word scoping comes from the word project scope. Do you know what's a project scope? Okay, the project scope is a written document which lays out all the requirements that come from the customer. That's like ensuring you're on the same page before you actually dive into the project and into the coding. Next, we offer a ballpark estimate. This is an optional step just to ensure we're on the same page about the budget. And next, in case there are any, um, any unclarities about the scope, we do discuss about the entire set of requirements in the project. And the deliverable is a requirements document, or the project scope. Now, at this level, we have clarity over what has to, over the what, that's the keyword, has to be delivered. Next, there might be some technical risks as in the case with the Kindle Fire. Here we run a few micro-prototypes which uh, have the goal of uncovering the technical risk, of mitigating the technical risks. This phase is called the discovery phase. That was the preparation. Now we are safe to make the estimate because we've hopefully uncovered all the known unknowns and eventually all the known unknowns and then we can communicate it to the client. Okay, let's move on. Qualify the client. How, do, how are we doing it? We discovered that it's quite easy to work with the customers who know what they want. They have clarity over that feature, over that requirement. For instance, if there's a customer who needs a custom payment gateway, they are very clear about the fact that we need uh, this only for normal orders, we don't need for subscriptions. Now that means we have clarity there, okay? Or there are a second type of customers, they don't know what they need and what they want, but they are willing to be consulted. Compared, compared to this type of customers, there are customers, and we've got this kind of requirements, who say, just build me a website and I'll tell you if I like it. Or even worse, build me two websites and I'll choose one of them. We discovered that it's very, very hard to impossible for us to work with these kind of customers. However, there are agencies which are very good at hand-holding these kind of customers. So I'm not saying the customers are bad or something. No, it's just finding the fit. That's what it, qualification is all about. And uh, next, quickly mentioning client is interested in the quality of the process of the deliverable, not merely in the price, we ensure the project size is, is of the right type for us. Uh, although we can tackle with projects of thousands of hours, but if that project is not breakable to small 50-hour milestones, we just don't take on that project. Because we know at 50 hours batches, 50-hour milestones or sprints, our estimation error is the lowest, because we keep statistics. And last but not least, we work with the clients, we choose to work with the clients who are in tune with our values. For instance, we avoid and we refuse customers who are selling ammunition, who are doing, um, uh, creating adult websites, who are harming animals or other beings. It's just a matter of a choice. I'm not saying that's bad in itself. It's a choice. Next, pre-scoping phase, okay? As I mentioned, uh, the deliverable here is a requirements document. So we basically understand, quickly understand the, the um, client's requirements uh, by asking a few questions to clarify what's, what's on his mind, what is his business context, and what are his business goals. Once we have clarity, high-level clarity at a high-level detail, over his requirements, we do check if we are on the same page about the budget. Why are we doing this? 
because the estimation process, it takes time to properly estimate the project, it takes time. How are you doing it? You can ask the customer directly. Do you have a budget on your mind for this project? Some of the customers will answer that openly, but some will just say, no, I can't tell you, or I don't know. In this case, we just, uh, based on our estim quick estimate, the ballpark estimate, we ask, is your budget above or below a certain figure? And by merely observing the reaction of the customer, even in writing, you can tell if you are on the within the same ballpark or on the same page. If the customer wants a website for 500 francs, and you know that's going to cost him at least 5,000, then it's clearly that you'd better recommend him another agency. Okay? Um, paid scoping phase. This is the phase where we actually take the time to fully understand um, what, what does this customer want to build. This is a consultancy project where we do interview the customer, we write down all the details. What do I mean by the details? I mean we enumerate all the user roles. This is a separate talk in itself, but just to quickly mention, user roles, uh, website or product or plugin objective, non-objectives, things which we clearly and mindfully know that we are not going to build into this current version. Next, for every user role, we go into details about the user stories. Everybody knows what's a user story? Okay, the term, quickly mentioning, the term comes from the agile method, agile philosophy, and it has a format like this. As a user role, as an admin, I want to be able to, dot, 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 for instance, to create new users because, reason, because we need uh, these users to be able to log in on their website. Okay? So that's an example of a thin sliced user story. Once you have this user story, it becomes much easier to estimate. Next, we deliver uh, this requirements document or the scope document, which can contain some diagrams, some schemas, some entity relationship diagrams, you name it. It contains everything that you need in order to provide the clarity of the project. Once you know the what, what you need to build, you might discover that there are some technical risks. There are those known unknowns. You know that something new in there that you don't know how to tackle it with, how to tackle it. Um, to take my, my similar previous example with a custom payment gateway for a third party for another country, you have never worked with that API to process credit cards. But here you might assume, well, I'm going to read the code from the Stripe P, from the Stripe WooCommerce extension, and I'm going to reuse the code. Well, that's an assumption. If you fail at that assumption, if in reality things turn out to be much different uh, between the two payment gateways, you will have to rewrite everything from scratch. Now the goal of, of the discovery uh, discovery phase is to elim eliminate these technical risks by shading the light on those technical areas that you don't have experience with. We deliver a micro prototype, which is generally speaking a very small sized piece of work, which has the goal of eliminating one technical risk. Okay, so the focus is very narrow. narrow. You might run several uh, micro-prototypes for, for the same project. I can give you now uh, a quick case study of, of a micro-prototype. We had to build a learning management system where tutors needed to post their courses, and then the students need to come on the website to choose a course and to sign up for the course. Okay? These courses are online courses in the so-called virtual rooms. Do you know what's a virtual room? It's like a video chat, group video chat, but it's specifically designed for, for learning, online learning. Now we ran a successful micro-prototype 
which used LearnCube. It's an API which offers virtual classrooms. And we needed to grab a link to an iframe with a virtual classroom. Guess what? This was the second microprototype. The first one failed. We used WizIQ. Now imagine if we were to estimate the entire project based on WizIQ, WizIQ WordPress plugin. It would have probably tripled the entire time because we would have allocated time and resources to use WizIQ, and then you've probably heard of escalation of commitment. We've invested so much time into this, we cannot give up on it. That's why we provide visibility upfront by eliminating technical risks with micro-prototypes. And now before we move into the actual process of the, of the how do we estimate, this is only the preparation, I'll show you our template. This is the template that we are using to create an estimate. We have here a list of tasks. We have expected best and worst estimates. It's a three-point estimate for every task. There's an assumption notes column where we, for every task, we, we, make, we note down what are the assumptions that we made for this particular estimate. Then we have the total for development for the three-point estimate. We add up some coefficients and we get the total. Ready to move forward? Let's do it. So, um, now that we are prepared to estimate the project, we have clarity, we've eliminated all the technical risks, we are ready to break down our project to tasks of maximum six hours. Why six hours? Because both from our practice and from other software companies, uh, from empirical evidence, it became clear that if a task that you, you've estimated takes more than six hours, then that's a clear sign there, the, there is an unknown unknown. It's something like, oh, it's going to take me 20 hours, take it out of here. Get, rid, get, it, get, get it out of here. That's a clear sign that you don't know. It's a black box. And uh, the empirical evidence shows that whenever you know what's in that black box, you're able to break down the task further. Now, if you are not able to break it down, then that's a clear red flag. You need the discovery phase, which I've mentioned earlier. Does it make sense? Good. Moving on. For every task from that template, from that list, we provide a three-point estimate. Have you ever worked with three-point estimates? This comes from, from PERT, P-E-R-T. Uh, it's a years old methodology for project management. And what does it say? It says the expected estimate is the number of hours, it's in hours, that I expect this task to normally take if I have previously worked on something similar. Now, the best case is it will turn out if things will, will go really, really smooth. Okay? Coming back to my earlier example with the custom, development, custom payment gateway, I'm assuming that that ABC payment gateway will be a more or less clone of the Stripe. Do you know about Stripe or PayPal? Let's use PayPal as an example. PayPal. Have you heard of PayPal? Good. So that's, that's a PayPal clone, okay, for the new ABC um, payment gateway. Now that's an assumption. And the expected estimate says, yeah, uh, I've previously worked on something similar. In this case, it's um, most of the code will just work right away. I just have to change some things here and there. Now imagine the worst case estimate is the case when you will need to code everything from scratch, which means if the expected estimate can be five hours, this one can be easily 50 hours. Let's come back to the same header example. I need to, to code a header of the, on a website. If that header will take me six hours, but then I know that I need to create some, some very uh, spectacular menu for Mawa mobiles, and then uh, I need a, another menu for Kindle Fire, then I will need to hand code everything for mobile, the HTML, I might be able to reuse it or not, and then for Kindle Fire, all right? And then we calculate the three-point estimate, and then we add up 
add up all the values to get the dev total. This is the development mm -hmm. total. But this is not everything. We have a few coefficients that we apply on top of the development to total. The first one is the coefficient for PM and testing, which in the industry can range between 10% and up to 40%, and it depends on the project time, the country the customer comes from, if the customer is very, very picky. There are customers which, which will, will really, really want everything neatly aligned. Others are fine with um, things well done. Then, you choose your own PM coefficient. And next, you add up your team's mean estimate error. What is the mean estimate error? This is a figure which tells you by how many percents or hours, on average, you over or underestimated. I have here an example of 29%. What does that mean? That means for, uh, hour, for 100 hours estimated, the estimated time, on average, this company delivers in 129 hours, like by 29 hours on top. So 129 minus 100, okay, divided by 100, the original estimate, it gives you the original estimate, the estimate error. Next, we confirm the estimate with a senior developer, then multiply by the hourly rate for the project, and we communicate the offer to the client. That was the process. A few things, a few takeaways for you, uh, and a few key things to consider when estimating. The first one might be surprising, but it works really, really well. And that is, be mindful. Be present when estimating projects. And what do I mean by that? I mean, when you have a design, really look at that design. Really see all the small and big, important and unimportant details. Okay? Make the estimate with a assigned developer, if it's possible. Make, uh, making sure that you make all the estimates auditable. What do I call auditable? If the senior developer looks at the estimate and at the design, he or she should be able to understand the estimate without asking anything. That means you have clarity. That's a very, very good sign that you have clarity over the estimate and the project. Make sure you write all your assumption notes in the column, and be, be, be aware that quality estimates will take time, so do plan for them, and carefully choose the projects by qualifying the projects and the, the, the clients. Carefully choose the projects you, you want to go into. And last but not least, if you want to have a learning process, do keep track of your estimates, versus actuals, estimates, actuals, estimates, actuals. That will allow you to have that mean estimate error for your team or for your team member. Good. Enough with the theory. Let me show you two case studies of how we are applying this process. And the first one is for a work safety management company. They needed a project where they go with a handheld on a construction website, and they check the compliance. Do all the workers wear their helmets? or not, and they report that, and so on. And the compliance is quite, quite a complex uh, area. And they uh, needed afterwards to print, to generate and print some PDF reports with the results of the compliance check. The, the fields in, in yellow are placeholders. Now, this is the estimate for one of the features, which is non-compliance form and report. This is how, uh, this is not the entire project, it's much bigger, <laughs> but I needed to fit it in one screen. So uh, if you look at the, this feature, create non-compliance gravity form, add autocomplete for drop-down fields where needed. 2.75, 2.5, 3.5. Now, if we look here, we will see our assumption. We will use gravity forms, and the autocomplete fields will work fine on mobile. But here is a technical risk, because this autocomplete field with search, in the case of gravity forms, surprise, surprise, they don't work on mobiles. Luckily, in this case, we were aware of this requirement. We were mindful enough to notice and to test it on mobile before we actually entered into the project. We've discovered that gravity forms uses chosen 
for the searches, which is completely disabled on mobiles. Now imagine how much time will it take you to, to build uh, from scratch a drop-down with search. And we ran a quick micro-prototype, which, which replaced chosen with select two in gravity forms. Then we were able to safely add here 3.5 hours. Okay? That was my case study number one. And case study number two, this focuses more on front-end development. And it's a case study about the unknown unknowns. Here uh, you can see a product page for a easy digital download shop. And if you look at this tiny, unimportant drop-down here, yeah, um, you probably won't say much about it. However, in the PSD designs that we received, there were some hidden layers, which we unfortunately didn't notice, which looked like this. Now this thing is a much more complex thing to build, because um, this is a completely non-standard EDD feature. It has custom HTML here. This sidebar is fixed. It has a peculiar user experience. It starts to move as you scroll, then it stops, and then it moves. So this drop-down should work fine while it's open, while you scroll, and that sidebar does all these tricks. And to make the things even funnier, these discounts should be dynamically calculated. OK. Now let me show you a bad estimate. This is the original estimate versus a mindful estimate, which I would do now after we finish the project. So section number one, title, 2.5 hours. Section number two, it's the middle. Uh, title is the header. Content is the, the central part. And sidebar is the sidebar. In reality, this should have looked like this. Point number one and number two, the same. Point number three is broken down to three points, to three subpoints. Create a sticky sidebar as per design. Create, add custom HTML to product dropdown and made the product selector dynamic. And you can compare the totals. OK, that's one point we were not mindful enough, and we've just missed some unknown unknowns. Moving on to the conclusions and some takeaways for you for today. Good estimates provide you with clarity, which in the end brings reliability. Be mindful when estimating WordPress projects. Be as present as possible. And last but not least, do break down your projects to six-hour maximum tasks. Otherwise, there are some unknown unknowns that you're not even aware you don't know. Thank you very much. Thank you to be on time, perfect. <laughs> You'll be perfect. Any question? <clears throat> Hi, thank Hi. you so much for this uh, very amazing uh, presentation, very interesting. My question is about what is a PM coefficient? Project management coefficient. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Hi, thank Hi. you for the presentation. Uh, I was wondering about the paid scoping phase. How do you sell it to your customer? Because it's more likely that they have asked other agencies to, uh, to scope to, and code the project, and how, yeah, how do you how do How do it? I sell, basically, these this, this, this paid scoping phases? We do this by doing a bit of pre-sales work. How does that work for us? We ask, and that's the keyword, some smart questions. And they see that we really uh, understand what's in there. We quickly understand, but we only ask enough questions to make the customer aware that he doesn't or she doesn't have all the answers. And then that's the moment. Usually it takes a maximum of one hour because we need to make this efficient. When we say, well, I will need you to write down all the details. If you're not able to do that, we can help you with that. At the end, you will get every, another keyword, reusable requirements document that you can reuse with other agencies to get prices, to get price quotes. That's how it works.
Thank you. I, I like very much your presentation. It's it's a kind of question we ask ourselves um, all the time. Also, <clears throat> for me, what is very difficult is to estimate the the communication skill of the client in advance, because some clients are um, very very bad in communication. So it means during the project you don't have the feedbacks, or they change their minds, or they are free to decide, but in different times. So, do you have a technique to kind of assess, or do you have a, a rating system like to add some coefficient for the bad communication of the client that you are expecting? Um, the short answer is no, we don't have a system for that, but that could be a good idea. However, how we are doing it now is, and you've mentioned two things, uh, delays in communication and changes, cha mind change, changes of mind, like they, they change their mind. Yeah, uh, they will change their mind if you go into the project without clarity. Unless you have clarity, and whenever they move outside of the boundaries of the project, then that's a clear sign, and you need to, you need to calibrate their expectations up front. This is the requirements document. This is what I'm estimating for. If you'll need anything else, we will need to update the project requirements document and the quote. So that's how we manage the out-of-scope things. Now, when it comes to the delays in communication, um, here we do discuss with the clients certain specific delivery, delivery, uh, delivery dates, like by uh, 10 of the month we will deliver the project, by 20 of the month we will need your feedback, and by 30 of the month we will provide you with a, a bug fixing, and I will expect you the payment to be made on 30 of, the, of that day, on, let's say, first of the next month. Okay? If the client cannot deliver his feedback by 20 of the month, what you can do, and you'd rather sign this in a contract, again, by calibrating expectations, by upfront telling, uh, telling upfront the customer that you're going to do that. Like, hey, after starting on 21st day, I'm going just to move further with the project based on the feedback that I got. And if you don't provide me with a picture, with the texts, okay, I will just put some dummy texts and images because I need to move forward. If, the, if you're upfront about that and the customer accepts it, that's okay for everybody. If he says, no, that's not okay, then you need to create another custom agreement between you two, which really depends on your case. The key word here is calibrate expectations. Hi, thanks for your uh, presentation. Just to put it in context, um, because the method is very interesting, but I'm just interested to know how big the company is in terms of Sure. The number of developers you work with, the, the kind of volume of business that sure. you do. Uh, we are now 10 people, a 10 people company. 10 people, full time employees. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh, it's one more thing, excuse oh, me. Oh. I have been using this where, when I was a freelancer as well. So it worked fine and then I scaled it up. 